Kabbalistic sources specifically, and that we can follow through in Torah history and development of the, the Jewish people, and also in the development of all inner experience. <clears throat> Let's try to identify that <coughs> and see it through. We're now reading the Pashas in the Torah, beginning of... We're now learning those sections in the Torah that deal with the beginnings, the very beginnings of the Jewish people. And as this follows through, this theme is one of the most important, and therefore one of the most important in the development of everything that is Jewish history and the life of every individual Jew, and in fact every human being. First of all, if you, if you read those sources that talk about these deeper ideas, there's an idea that, again, to understand these things in their source is probably impossible for us, but let's note at least what the deepest level of Torah wisdom teaches, <coughs> and then we'll see if we can begin to understand it by considering its, its application. Be very careful with these ideas because the words are always borrowed. Anything that you have from the from the deeper level of Torah teaching is always an idea that is, by definition, it is beyond words. The words themselves are only, you know, when we talk about the secret wisdom, the secret wisdom, the fourth level of depth or derivation in any Torah subject, that area is called Sod. Sod, sod means the secret level. But the other level, the simple level, that's the first one, <laughs> the level of the <clears throat> that which is hinted or perhaps learnt by derivation, that's the second level. The third level is a very deep level that needs to be, deep work needs to be done to, to bring it out. And the fourth level is called Sod. So that voyage, that journey into what's known as the Orchard of Torah, Pardes, that level of, that fourth level is known as the secret world, the Kabbalistic world, <clears throat> the world of secret. People think, People think that that which is a secret, again, we hear all these things exactly the opposite to the way they should be heard. We think that that which is secret is secret because you haven't been told. The, to the English ear, English-speaking ear, we think that that which is secret, wisdom, is secret because it's been kept secret. In other words, no, one, no one's told you. And that's why we refer to it as a secret. A secret is that which has not been divulged. Meaning that if someone would tell you, then you'd know about it. So the picture you have is that there's a wisdom which underlies all wisdom. It's known as the secret wisdom. And it's esoteric. It's an esoteric wisdom. You don't know it. People don't tell you that secret. You need a lot of qualifications before someone will teach you. But if you have those qualifications, one day you'll learn Torah for many years, you'll be married, you'll be over 40, and you'll have... Oh. That concept we have is that it's a secret wisdom. When you have those qualifications and you have that level of depth and maturity then somewhere in some forgotten corner of the old city of Yerushalayim, you'll find someone who will let you into the secret, they'll tell you the information, then you'll know it. It's a very serious misconception. The, the concept is not that it's secret wisdom that no one told you, and when they tell you, you'll know it. In Torah, the words always describe the essence of a thing. If something is secret because no one told you, then it's not essentially secret. The concept, again, you have to think about it more carefully than that. If the word secret is used, it means that the wisdom is intrinsically secret, which means that um, no one could ever tell you. That means there aren't any words. It's not that someone didn't tell you yet. It means it's that wisdom that doesn't live in words. Nobody could ever find the words to tell you. It's that which you must discover on your own. That's what it means. That's why in the tradition that is handed down about these things, it says that the master tells his disciples only the general headings of the general areas. And then... He has to figure out for himself, he has to work out for himself the depth of the material. Because it cannot be put into words. And therefore one has to be extremely careful about the words that are used to convey the wisdom. Because by definition those are not the words. In other words, what we're saying is, if you hear the words used and you think you've understood, then for sure you haven't understood. But if you feel confused and you haven't grasped it, then there's a possibility that you may in fact... That's the nature of the, that, that's the, nature of the subject. And there's an idea that says as follows. <clears throat> I'm careful now because <coughs> not to use the words out of their out of their proper place. But it says in the sources that deal with these things that every time a light shines, 
it shines twice. But the light shines once, and that, in fact, is an illusion. The light then gets taken away, and it shines a second time, and that is the time that is meaningful. But it couldn't shine the second time unless it was there the first time. So it says, it's called the first light and the second light. Yeah, very deep Kabbalistic ideas. And <laughs> it's a fundamental concept that all the deeper sources use in many different ways. First there's a darkness. The darkness is illuminated by light. Can't have a light unless there's darkness first. How the darkness develops is another story. We don't talk about that now. But there's a light that shines the first time. But by definition, that light cannot last. The reason it can't last is because the sources say that it doesn't belong there. It's a light that belongs in a higher place, and therefore it goes back to where it belongs. It leaves certain things behind. There's all, a lot of detailed information here. And then, the second time the light shines, it's the light that belongs in this place. In fact, the function of the first light is to open up the place. And the second light shines in, and that's where it belongs. Now, a lot of detailed discussion in the, in the, in the sources that talk about these things. And the Kabbalists throughout the ages have worked with these concepts. But let's try to take the, the approach this evening of working out the application of this idea. And let's see how it fills itself out, how it applies throughout Torah history and Torah thinking, and see if we can bring it down to our own li application in our own lives. Let's perhaps try to identify it. We are, we've identified it in its pure source, in abstraction. Let's try to identify it in its historical source <coughs> and see if we can generalize from there. If we look at the formation of the Jewish people, obviously, anything that happens throughout our history must be located in the moment of our formation. And I believe we've studied together in this, in this forum the idea that everything that happens must have happened before. That in, that in the development of a child, all is laid down in the moment of conception. When you see a pregnancy of a child, child developing throughout pregnancy. You see that all the features that the embryo develops, they must have been coded for in the genes. All that's happening in this process of development is what was laid down in the genes. In fact, the same sources say that the first light is the light that generates the conception, and the second light is the light that generates the development throughout the pregnancy. The one is the, the, one is the flash that begins the process, and the second is the, is the process itself. If the Jewish people are formed by certain events, then it must be that those form the genes, if you like, of what we are, and we must find those same events reflected throughout everything that we've ever experienced. <coughs> Let me make it practical and see if we can understand a bit better. Stay with me carefully. What happens when the Jewish people are formed? They we're taken out of Egypt, right? And the process was one of a light being shone, and at the moment of greatest uplift, the light was taken away, and then there was a process of developing the light a second time in a completely different way. Now, let's try to work that out. In, in Egypt itself, in Mitzrayim, right, the Jewish people were enslaved, it was a time of tremendous darkness, again, there's always the darkness before the light shines. In fact, the word Mitzrayim, if you think about it carefully, the word Mitzrayim, which means Egypt, right? in English the word Egypt means Egypt. <clears throat> but in Hebrew, Mitzrayim means a place of, of straightened circumstances. Mitzrayim in Hebrew means to be squeezed, to be squeezed where there's no room, no room for spiritual development. There's no possibility of transcendence. In fact, the same deeper sources say that the word Mitzrayim spells Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means a constriction of the 50. 50 in Hebrew is always that which denotes transcendence, right? There's 49 gates or 49 levels to the manifest or revealed world, the 50th is that which transcends them completely. Mitzrayim is the place in which the 50th, that means the spiritual development, <coughs> I mean, I'm sure your minds are racing ahead of me, right? You didn't, I'm sure you didn't come this evening just to listen passively. <coughs> I'm sure you're listening actively and your mind's already racing ahead. And your minds have already raced ahead to the process of the Exodus. And how many days did it take to reach the Sinai experience? 50 days, that's what you were about to say, right? <laughs> 50 days. After the experience of darkness in Egypt, the Torah was given on the 50th day. That means there were 49 stages of development in the desert, and the 50th was the moment of transcendence. Torah is beyond all limitation. Torah is not the 50th step, it's that which is beyond all steps. It's essential to know this. You know that 49 days of Sphira, so we count the 49 days of Sphira. Right? We count. We count from Pesach to Shavuot, right? From Pesach to Shavuot, we count 49 days. 
The Torah says count 50 days. Tisperu chamishim yom. The Torah says absolutely explicitly count 50 days. It, nothing could be clearer. It's an absolutely explicit instruction. Count 50 days. And how do we do it? The first night we get up and we count this is day one. The second day we count this is day two. We obey the instruction literally. <clears throat> when it gets to the 50th day we say nothing. On the 50th day, which is Shavuos itself, on that Chag, we don't count the 50th day of the Omer. Why do we only count 49? Are, are, you, are you with me? Why do we only count 49 days when the Torah says count 50 days? It says count 50 days. We count 49, we say nothing on the 50th. Why? Because it's basic to Torah understanding that the 50th is not a number. It's the concept of transcending number. It is that which is beyond all number. <coughs> And therefore, the way we count the 50th day is by not counting it. By not giving it a number. If you gave it a number, then it would be one more than 49, just like 49 is one more than 48. You would be limiting it to a finite point on the line of numbers. And the whole concept of the 50th is that it's the spiritual meaning of that idea is that it's that which transcends anything that can be quantified. And therefore, we count 49 days, and when we enter the zone of the 50th, which is that which is beyond number, obviously we don't give it a number. We fulfill the instruction, understand this, we fulfill the instruction to count 50 days, right, by not counting the 50th. It means we've now arrived in that zone which is Shavuos, the giving of the Torah, which is Torah itself, which is by definition that which transcends all boundaries, all limits and all limitations. That is the concept of 50. <laughs> now the, the word, the word sea, the word for an ocean in Hebrew is Yam, right? Yam, the ocean. The letters of Yam are Yud Mem, which is 50. Remarkable thing. The Torah says, Aruka me Eretz Mita. It's, it's measure. Understand? Again, if you, if, you, if you speak another language other than Hebrew, you can't begin. And if you don't, un- you don't have control of, you don't have insight into the original text itself, that, then Torah is a very, 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 very superficial almost meaningless image and reflection of itself. The Prophet says, Aruka me Eretz Mida, the length of the Torah is longer than the land, longer than the land, Urechavva mina yam, and it's broader than the sea. So the, the, the unschooled ear hears a poetic expression. Torah is so vast that it's longer than all the land and it's broader than all the sea. But there's nothing poetic in Torah. Torah is all poetry. But it's poetry that has all meaning. And if you look carefully at the verse, Aruka me Eretz Mida, the word Mida in Hebrew, which means a measure, adds up to 49. That Mem Dalada is 49, which means that the measure of the Torah is longer than the land. You know what the difference is between the land and the sea? The land is that which has landmarks. It's a process. Right? Land is identified. The concept of, of land is that you can have a pathway through the land, except for a desert. A desert is a special thing. I can't talk about that. But all land other than a desert is a place where there are, there, are, there are landmarks and you can move. But in the ocean there are no landmarks. What's unique about the sea, and that's why the Torah refers to the land as long and the sea as wide. Wide is a concept of... Wide is a concept that has nothing to do with going anyplace. It's a concept of how you feel when you're there. We describe this world as long and the next world as wide. Arukame Eretz Midah means its length is longer than the land. Its 49 levels are longer than the land. Urechava mina yam, but its 50th dimension is broader than the sea. So we have a process of 49 steps, which are steps of development. And then there's the 50th, which transcends all Mitzrayim. You have to understand, Egypt is the place of constriction of the 50th. In that place, no spirituality is possible. It's so earthy, it's so... The Torah calls Mitzrayim Erva Sa'aretz. It means that... The, the words are so unrefined that in English it's impossible to repeat them. It means that that part of the world that is so corrupt and so steeped in sensual immorality that it's referred to as very, very blatant expression. That's what Egypt is referred to. It's a place of such sensual corruption and intensity that there's no possibility of spirituality. That's what Egypt is. And the Jewish people are enslaved in that world. That means they're caught in a world of such physicality that all... Any, any effort of spirituality is completely impossible. Right? And what happens there? That the spiritual world reveals itself. At the end of the slavery, a process of upliftment begins, where the Jewish people begin to be uplifted one stage after another. Each plague that strikes the Egyptians right, is a further upliftment and revelation to the Jewish people of what the higher worlds really are. 
You know that the slavery ended with the first plague. Huh? The slavery, the, the, the exile did not take, the, the, the exodus did not take place. That they had to wait until the night of the tenth, of the tenth plague. But the slavery ended with the first. And from then on the Jewish people sat back and watched the show, basically. They sat back and watched Egypt destroyed, level after level. When they reached the, the night of the tenth, right, when the firstborn were destroyed, Egyptian first were, firstborn were destroyed, and that incredible moment of ending of the, of the, of the, of the exile, and that moment of exodus began, Jewish people went out of Egypt, it was an unprecedented high. That what people saw then, they saw a measure of divine revelation that was impossible to conceive of before. You're talking about a, a people for hundreds of years who'd been enslaved, you know, in the most brutal and psychologically and physically brutal circumstances, living only on a vague memory of a faith that they had from their previous generations, they were uplifted to an unprecedented extent. What happened after that? Seven days, right? You remember seven days walking to the Red Sea, and then the sea split. That was the highest moment that any human being had ever experienced. The, the, the Gemara says that at that moment, the lowliest of the Jewish people, completely undeveloped member of the Jewish people then, saw more than the greatest prophet ever saw subsequently. An unbelievable revelation. They saw seven levels of sin. Tremendous moment of, of intensity. And then comes the surprise. Stay carefully with me. What happened at that moment of incredible intensity was that after that they were dropped in the desert and they had to move through 49 stages, 42 more days, if you like, completing 49 stages of arriving at the 50th, which was the giving of the Torah, which so far surpassed the intensity of what they'd seen before that there's no way to describe the difference. Let's just get the pathway clear. Now we'll try and explain what it means, but first let's get the observation clear, the facts. First is a process of darkness, right? They're enslaved. It means all kinds of slavery. So intense the slavery, almost no possibility of redemption. And then the redemption begins. And what happens? There's, there's level after level of revelation. The light begins to shine. An incredible intensity of light. When it gets to its peak, it reveals seven days later that that really was nothing. There's such a blaze of spiritual light that it's impossible for us to begin to imagine what it was like. And then the opposite occurs. Then they get put in the desert. And they have to struggle through the desert in order to get to a light that comes after that, that makes the previous one pale into insignificance, the second light. What does this mean? First of all, just let's understand the process. You know a desert, let's understand, what does it mean walking through a desert? Let's get that clear. Yeah? We understand that when the plagues occurred and all evil was destroyed in Egypt, the Jewish people saw Hashem's hand clearly. And they saw tremendous revelation of His presence. What does it mean when He left them in the desert to move through the... You know that... In simple terms, the desert means a place of sand where there's no water. Now, that's what a desert means when you're six years old. When you're 16 and 26 and 36 and you've learned Torah, then you should be forming a much more sophisticated concept of what all these things mean. Of course it means a desert. Of course it means they walk through a place of sand. But it means much more than that. The concept of a desert is a place in which there is no life. If in the physical description it means a place of only sand where nothing grows and there's no water, then on the spiritual plane it means a world of death energies. You know that the word midbar in Hebrew is from the root dabar. Dabar means speech. Dabar means, dibur in Hebrew, that root means intelligent transmission, intelligent translation of an abstract idea into manifest form. It means control. It means meaningful control. <laughs> But Yad Ber Amin Tachtenu means when one nation has control over other nations and the other nations follow the directives of this nation. That's what Yad Ber means. It's a place of intelligent direction. That's what it means. Midbar is the place in which there's no direction. And it's one of those remarkable words in Hebrew that mean two opposites, two opposite extremes in the same word. That a place of no speech. It's a place of, of, of total desolation. There's no voice. There's no speech. There's no meaningful manifestation. Nothing speaks to you in the desert. There's no... What happened then? They had to move through this desert dimension in order to get to Sinai. Just to understand how deep this death energy in the desert is. Now, let's just spend a moment and understand that. You remember that later when the Jewish people had to go through the desert, not for 49 days, but because of their mistake, they had to spend 38 years, 40 years in the desert. You remember that they were tested 10 times with enormous ordeals, and we failed every one of those tests. Do you remember this? Anyone out there? When the Jewish people wandered in the desert, they were faced with ten massive spiritual ordeals and failed all of them. What does this mean? The desert is a place of such intense death forces 
that all evil raises itself against you in the desert. Jewish people, you know, what the, you know what the idea was? The Jewish people were supposed to witness ten plagues in Egypt for free and passively. That means they didn't do anything. All they did was sit back and watch how Hashem did it. He was destroying ten levels of, e of evil in Egypt. The idea was to then put us in the desert and throw all ten levels of the world's evil at us and expect us to do what had been demonstrated before. Again, the first light took place in Egypt. Hashem said, watch this. You sit back and watch how it's done. Ten mystical spheres, if you like, of evil right, were decontaminated, were, were destroyed, were purified in Egypt. Then he put us in the desert and said, I'm now going to give you the root of all those levels of evil, and this time you destroy them, because the world is yours to protect. Right? This, that's our function here. The idea was that we had to go from the lowest point on earth, which is Mitzrayim, to the highest point on earth, which is Israel, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, and on the way we had to conquer the desert. The desert means all ten levels of death and negativity, and we were supposed to perfect all ten of those. Had we done that, the final result would have been Israel, Messianic revelation, and perfection forever. And we failed all ten of them. You have to understand that in Torah, every time ten is mentioned, it's always the same ten. It's not accidental. <laughs> ten sayings that created the world, ten ordeals that Avram, Avin, or Abraham had a battle against, ten commandments right, that were the result of these ten. You have to understand, always, <laughs> they're always yeah, so obvious. What was the tenth of the plagues? Destruction of the firstborn. What was the tenth of the ordeals of Abraham? Destroying his firstborn. I and mean, you can't miss it. But they all parallel each other exactly, right? It's always the same points that are being, same points of reference. In fact, the Maral says a beautiful thing, a, a fundamental thing to understand. You know that the plagues in Egypt proceeded in reverse order of the sayings of creation. You know that? Understand well. The concept is that in Egypt, the Egyptians had contaminated the spiritual world, right? It was a place of intense negativity, and therefore the purifying of that band had to take place on ten, ten levels. Hashem appeared in Egypt, and He knocked out all ten levels that they had... Con the world is built on ten sayings. What does it mean that Hashem created the world with ten sayings? Right? Let, first, the first saying was, Braces in the beginning. The second was, let there be light. Right? Ten sayings create the world. The point of beginning, of firstness, then the light itself, and so forth. Until you have ten layers, ten mystical spheres, if you like, ten dimensions of creation. Since the Egyptians had destroyed the world entirely, they, 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 they toxified it, if you like, spiritually, so Hashem had to purify it on all ten levels. That's why there were ten plagues. The Maral even points out that the ten plagues went in reverse order of the sayings of creation. Why? Because the, the sayings of creation had built the world in its purity, and the Egyptians had contaminated. So there were ten, and that's why they went in reverse, in the reverse order. How do you create something? You start with infinite dimensionless center, right? Then you build a layer around that and around until finally you have your structure. But when you cleanse the thing that's been built, you must peel away the layers from the outside until you get back to the infinite center. And therefore the plagues went in reverse order. What was the first of the sayings of creation? Horatius, in the beginning. What was the last of the ten plagues? Destruction of the firstborn, the, the point of firstness, of first birth and first creation. What was the second of the sayings of creation? Let there be light. What was the second last of the plagues? The plague of darkness. The Maral works through all... This is simple Chumash. I mean, if you haven't learned this, if you didn't learn this at Cheder, <laughs> then there's no hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> and the Maral works through all ten plagues and shows you how each of them is the exact reversal of that corresponding statement of the creation of the world. Why? To show you that the Egyptians had contaminated it all and Hashem was purifying it all. And it was all for demonstrating what we were supposed to do when we got into the desert. Egypt was the world of contamination of Egypt. But the desert was the dimension of contamination of all of creation. What he did in a microcosm in Egypt was a demonstration so that we could get the idea so that when we faced all those levels of death and destruction in the desert, which is what desert means, we could conquer all of them and build a world of perfection. You have to understand that a desert is a place where all evil in the world is ranged against you. Now, if that's true, let's build our concept again. Okay, are we together so far? Yes? Not so sure. Not so sure. Let's try. With what we've learned now, let's go back to our let's go back to our base. Right? What do we have? Experience in Egypt in the ultimate and utter darkness. What happens? Incredible upliftment. Tremendous light that gets shone. Tremendous demonstration of purity. And as soon as the upliftment reached its peak and the Jewish people stood at the sea and the sea split and they saw everything there was to see spiritually, then it all closes. Then they dropped in the desert, which is the ultimate death and and and, and in difficult dimension of difficulty, and Hashem says, now you do it yourself. And only after we got through that did we get to Sinai. 
which is the ultimate meeting with Hashem and the giving of the Torah forever. What is the pathway? Hear carefully. If you hear this well. Life is built with two lights. The first life you get given for free. And just when you think it will never leave you, it gets very cruelly taken away and you get plunged into darkness. And only if you survive through the darkness does the second light shine on you. But you shine the second light. The first is only a demonstration of what it could be and what it should be. But you don't understand what it is. You haven't worked for it. You haven't done it. It's completely artificially done. It's incredible and stimulating and inspiring and marvelous when it happens. And it's so marvelous you think it will never leave you. And as soon as you grasp it, the moment you grasp what it is, it gets taken away exactly then. The moment of coolest disappointment. And it gets taken away. And then you're left in the darkness to make the light shine yourself. What's the reason? Because you're here to make it happen yourself. You're not here for free gifts. The world is not a free free lunch. The world's not a free experience. It's, a, it's an experience of being put here to struggle through it yourself and making it happen. When you make it happen the second time, it is you. The first time, it's a light that shines on you. The second time, it's your glow. But how could you do it yourself if you weren't shown it first? So what happens is you get shown it first artificially, and just when you thought you've understood it, and just when you think that you've done it yourself, because you know it's an illusion, then you get let down with a terrible crash. Terrible thing. And then you realize, but now you realize that it could be done. You've been there once. Now you have to struggle through the desert on your own, battling all hell and all evil to get back to make it a genuine experience the second time. Okay. Let's, try to, let's try to take this root pattern and see if we can apply it and see if we can... Uh, the truth is, this applies to every single experience in life. Every new friendship, every intellectual experience, every revelation, every, everything that you realize, everything that you come across, every human experience, every physical experience, every experience within marriage, what marriage is itself, all human experience is subject to a free gift first, a cruel disappointment, and only if you realize what the pattern is and struggle through the disappointment and make it happen, you get to the real thing at the end. You know, even the body is built that way, you know that? Even your body is built in such a way that no inspiration or stimulation of the body ever lasts, you know? If you feel something, your nerve endings only feel it as you make contact. And then they adapt. Right? There's a tolerance that, an adaptation of tolerance, you can't feel it anymore, you have to do it again. If you smell something, you're only aware of it as it impinges on your sense. After it's been there for a while, you cannot detect it anymore. If you hear a sound, it's only when some aspect of the sound is new that you realize it's there. After it's been there for a while, you become completely desensitized. In fact, when the noise stops, you're surprised to realize that it was there. Your body's built in such a way that it has only sensitivity for a very brief instant. Right? And then it dulls into insensitivity. Men, men typify this perfectly. Women, women live in the second dimension. Women are strong in the second life. Men are thrilled by the first life. That's what being a man is. That's what being a woman is. That needs more thought and more development. But nevertheless, that's the way the world is. The same sources who mention what I've been discussing till now, they say that you have to understand the going out of Egypt took place in Nisan, the month of Nisan. The, 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 the time in the desert was Sivan, that's Iyar, the next month is Iyar, and the month of the giving of the Torah is Sivan. Right? What are those three months Kabbalistically? Nisan, first of all, you can't miss it, the word is Nisim, it means a, a month of miracles. Miracle is not something you do, it's something that you have demonstrated. In fact, the animal that is the zodiac, you know what the zodiac is of Nisan? It's the sheep. The zodiac sign of Nisan is the sheep. Right? Why? Because it's a passive animal that gets led. It has none of its own strength. Hashem took us out of Egypt. Passively, we were led out of Egypt. Iyar is the month of the ox, the bull, which is an animal of its own willful strength. That's what we developed in the desert. And Sivan, what is the sign? What's the zodiac of Sivan? Gemini, twins. You see what's happening? First is the complete passivity. Then there's the development of complete activity. And then there's the total harmony of twins. And that's what Sivan is. It's Hashem and us, the two Luchos, it's Moshe and Aaron, it's the Jewish people in the Torah. It's all the dualities that are in perfect harmony. Right? But the only way you can get to perfect harmony, a love situation between two equals, is where one does it entirely at first, and the other one then has to do it entirely, and then there's a perfect harmony. So all of life goes that way. All of life is an experience of newness, the thrill of newness, and just when you maximally inspired by the thrill of newness, you get let down, and only if you have the courage and insight and tenacity to go through the period of darkness can you get back to a real light at the end that then makes you realize that the first one was only a false experience. 
If you don't know this message, your life is doomed. You're doomed to failure. You're doomed to a life of depression. You're doomed to a life of depression because every experience that inspires you will let you down. And you think you've been let down. You think you've made the wrong person. You think you've made friends with the wrong individual. You think you've taken the wrong profession. You'll think everything's wrong about your life. Because you don't realize that your life's designed to be that way. The inspiration of nothing lasts. Life is designed in such a way. Why is it designed that way? Let's understand. Let's, let's, think, it, let's think it through. You know, the best martial perhaps, you know, <coughs> when a father teaches his child to walk, the father takes a little child, he's never taken a step before. The father takes the child by the hands and he lifts him to his feet. <coughs> and the father takes a gentle step backwards and the child takes his first, his first step. It's an incredible moment. Unbelievable moment. The child walking. The little child is standing up on his feet. He's taking his first step. He's actually walking. It's a moment of tremendous exhilaration. But th- you have to hear well. Not only is he walking, but he cannot fall. Not only is he walking, but he cannot fall. His other's holding his hands. Right? And as he thrills to that experience and he exil- exults in, the, in, the, in this level that he's reached, Abba lets go. His father lets go. And that's the coolest of disappointment. The child is standing there now in a terror of, of, of danger. Right? He's standing there. All that he can do is fall. The one whom he trusted has let him down. The one whom he trusted, the one who gave him this uplift, the one who is responsible for getting into the situation of, of tremendous inspiration and uplift is the very one who has let him down cruelly. The tremendous sense of betrayal right, and terror and fear. And he has no other option. And that's when he takes his first step. And that's when he learns to walk. And when he takes his first step alone and learns to walk, he then realizes, only then can he realize, that in the moment of his father's abandonment was a greater love manifest than in the moment when his father held his hands. But there's no way that he could understand that when he was feeling abandoned. Only when he's been through that and realizes what it means, then he rushes into his father's arms and then, then the, tears of, the tears of real equality are shed. But that's the way it goes. Couldn't learn to walk otherwise. Why does Hashem do that? Because if he never showed it to you, you wouldn't know that it, you wouldn't know that it could be done. You wouldn't know how to do it. So he does it for you first. That's a very cruel disillusionment. Eh? You think you're doing it. No, it's not. You're not doing it. You're not at all doing it. You've never done it at all. It's being done for you. But you've been put into that situation, so now you can do it. At the moment of abandonment, when the darkness of the ordeal begins, and you get left and let down and abandoned, and you feel the terror of loneliness, that only if you know that this is being done so that the real life will shine at the end can you survive that experience. Otherwise, nothing crueler than that. But a generation that's not been brought up with Torah knowledge doesn't know that. So every experience in life crumbles, crumbles to dust. It's a complete disillusionment. The person doesn't know this. Life is an intense misery, a fearsome situation. A Jew has to know that every time you have an uplifting experience, you have to be very, very hesitant about it. Very, very wise and hesitant about it. Not get carried away. You get carried away. Not foolishly think that this can never end. On the contrary, every time you have an uplifting experience, you have to grasp from that moment what you meant to grasp that. You grasp the exaltation and the elevation and the, and the up. You have to understand it. That's what it's meant for, but you have to understand it's going to go. And it's meant to go. And you should be so prepared for it that the moment it goes, you move right in yourself. Then the whole experience can be one of... Let's try and examine a few experiences in life and see if we can see, if we can see this pattern. There's no question that the most important one is marriage. That's the, the, the most intense disaster of misunderstanding of this area. But let's work through a few more basic until we a few more basic experiences until we get there. You realize, of course, that if this is the basic pattern of all life experience, then it has to be please, please concentrate with me. If you take life as a timeline, if this pattern that we're describing is the experience of all life, of all life, yes, it's an accurate description of all life, then it follows that no matter where you cut the timeline, you should be able to perceive two stages. Can you see that? Again, if this is a basic building block of all of life, it doesn't matter whether you look at life as an entire span in which you'll see a first phase and a second phase, or you look at a first phase only, you'll see a first and a second phase. It doesn't matter how big or how small you cut the, a segment. If, by definition, this is the root, then every part must contain the pattern of the whole. Can you see that? Not convinced. One of the deepest teachings in the spiritual wisdom is that every part always contains the same pattern as the whole. 
That's how Hashem's unity penetrates down to the smallest fragment of reality. That even what appears to be the smallest differentiated fragment of reality is in fact enough to teach you about the whole. You never have to look at anything. You can look at any part of reality to learn about the whole. Is this clear? You don't have to look at the whole. You can take one atom, one molecule. You can take anything you like. It teaches about the whole world. There are sources that say when the Jewish people stood at Sinai, any Jew present could have manufactured a whole universe from any verse in the Torah. Not from the whole Torah. Just knowledge of any verse in the Torah would have been enough to reproduce the whole world. A simple... I don't see too many enlightened faces. Let's take a simple example. Unfortunately, we are people that we have to bring it down to our own bodies. Mipsori Yechse, from my flesh, I see these... You should see all of this from your flesh. You know how the human body is built? In every cell of the body, in every cell of the body, there are the genes of the whole body. Is that remarkable? It's a remarkable thing. It didn't have to be that way. I, I think we've discussed this before. I don't know. But it, the, the, the simple engineering solution to how to build the body would be that you have one genetic complement in the first cell. When it divides into two and to four and to eight and to sixteen and so forth, the parts of that genetic string that are going to code for feet should go down to feet. And the part that will code for eyes should go to where the eyes are. Are, are you with me? Each part of the body should get the little piece that manufactures what it is. But that's not how the body works. Do you know how the body works? When that first cell of the child is being formed in the, in the moment of conception, as the pregnancy develops, the first cell divides into two identical cells. Two identical cells. The two div- divide into four identical cells. In fact, the proof is that if you pluck one of them out and put it on its own, it will grow into an entire human being, not a quarter. You don't get a quarter of a human being if you take one of those cells. You get an entire human being. And when it becomes 8 and 16 and 32 and 64, you can pluck any of them out and you'll grow an entire human being. Not one sixty-fourth of a human being, you won't grow a finger. <laughs> so it is. And what happens? After it's divided a certain number of times, and you have so many identical cells, with the same full genetic complement in each of them, some of them start becoming feet and start, some start becoming a head. Science has no clue about how that happens. They're all the same, you understand. They've all got the same genetic message. Finally, when the whole thing's expressed, what do you have? You have cells in your toes that have got a full genetic complement. Each cell from your toe has the whole code for all of you. Except the part that says toes is working and the other parts are sleeping. They're dormant. The light is not shining there. And in the back of your eye, in the retina, the cells that make up your retina, now, each of them has the genes for the whole body. But the part that says eyes is busy making eyes and the rest is sleeping. You could take any cell from any part of your body and duplicate your entire self. Why anybody would want to do that beats me. But the point is, you could do that. You could replicate your entire self from any cell in your body. Any part always has the total within it. So if you take life, and we say that the most basic message, right, the deepest, one of the deepest secrets of the pattern of life, is that there's a first phase which is free and, and inspirational and and then it gets taken away and the second phase is dark and difficult, then it must follow that wherever you cut light, you'll find the same thing. Is this clear now? Let's let's try and study it. Let's cut light into a few segments and see if we can identify it. First of all, take it at a broader scale, broader scale for now, life consists of a soul and the Shama that is in the higher world, then it gets put into a body, right, and exists in the moment of conception, becomes a, cha- a fetus, develops through pregnancy, is born, etc., and lives a life. Can you see the two phases? What is the first phase? And the Shama in the higher world, without a body, talk about inspiration. That is in the Shama that's part of Hashem's light. That is completely unlimited. And then it gets shrunken into a body. Do you know what it says? It says when the Shama cries, and weeps, and moans, it goes through the most intense torture. The moment it gets told that it's going to put into a body, it starts to cry. Because it's in the world of complete, infinite expanse. Maximum expansion. And Hashem says, I'm going to put you into a human body, a limited, finite body, and a body at that, which has got its smells, and it's, it's, it contains its own excrement, and it's given to disintegration. It's a very, very constrained situation for a soul, for a shaman. But that's when it develops. It's only when it's put into a body with all its loneliness and all its challenge that it can become what it's supposed to become before it's only potential energy. You know what the Medrash says? How the, the Neshama grasps this transition? Hashem comes to the soul and says, I'm going to put you in a body. And the Neshama starts weeping. The soul starts crying. Please don't do that to me. Let me stay with you. 
And Hashem says to this weeping soul, I'll put you in a body for only one second, and then you can choose. So the Shama agrees. So Hashem takes the soul and puts it into a body, and then the soul says, don't kill me. And that's how you get born. <coughs> that's the moment of transition. <coughs> Let's try and cut it, yes? Let's try and cut it a little bit more narrowly. Forget the world before this. Let's take pregnancy. Let's take the phase of pregnancy and birth and life. Can you see two phases? The child living as a fetus inside the mother is the first phase. The child that's born and lives a life in this world is the second. Why? You know what happens to a child? You know what the Gemara says? A child that within its mother's body, a fetus, right? An embryo developing within the mother, the uber, the, 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 the fetus, is taught the whole Torah. Right? A malach, an angel appears, learns Torah with the child throughout its months of pregnancy. It says during that time a light is lit above its head and it sees from one end of the world to the other. Right? There's a light that illuminates its head. And with this light it sees from one end of the world to the other. Learns, you have to stand, you have to listen carefully. Yeah, every word, all these things are... Silly. You know, when you wish to illuminate something so you can see it, you don't shine a light on the head, you shine a light on what you wish to see. Again, are you with me? You have to understand, every, when the sages use an analogy, right, every detail is perfect. You don't light a light above someone's head yes, that shines on the head when you wish them to see something. You keep them in darkness and you shine light on the scene you wish them to see. When the Medrash, when the Midrashim say that the light is lit on the head, it means that's where he sees it. You have to understand this. Anyway, the child sees the whole world, he learns the whole Torah, he knows everything he needs to know about the world. This little child knows the whole Torah. The sources say it means he knows his own Torah, he knows his own Chalik Torah, he knows what he has to be. He knows every detail of his life, every detail of all of his capacity and his potential. He knows the wisdom of every branch of knowledge, he knows everything that there is to know about the world and exactly where he fits in. He knows everything that there is. And Kevin said, know that the moment that he's burned, Bar Malach, an angel comes, the Sesra Piv strikes him on the mouth and he forgets all of his wisdom. And he's born a little newborn child who knows nothing about the world, he knows no Torah, he's a completely unschooled child who knows nothing and has to spend a lifetime of struggling to gain any wisdom. Can you see the two phases? And the obvious question is, <laughs> the obvious question is, most obvious question is, why would Hashem teach, why would an angel teach a, Torah, a child the whole Torah and then make him forget it? Why would God, why would Hashem detail an angel to teach a child the whole Torah, <laughs> teach him everything he is to know about all wisdoms, and then take it away? What's the point of teaching somebody something if you're then going to make him forget it? What does that mean? Can you see what it means? The father's holding his hand, <coughs> lifts him up, and at the moment when it's all clear and all grasped, then the father, let's go. See what happens is this, the child gets taught the whole Torah, and then at the last moment as he's about to be born, he gets, it gets taken away. But it's not taken away. It's not taken away. You understand this. Listen well. When the father holds the child's hands and he takes his first step and then the father lets go, he doesn't take away the experience. He just lets go. But there's a memory lingering on of what that first step felt like. You don't have it anymore. Now you just feel terror. But deep within you is a knowledge of how it felt. All you have to do is really do it again. When Hashem takes away the Torah that this child is, you know, when the child is born, it doesn't mean taken away. It's been driven deep into your subconscious, but it's all there. It's all there. It's swirling around just beneath the surface and it's just out of reach, but you've been there once. And any ordeal in life, and any challenge, and any intellectual challenge, and any emotional challenge, you've been there once before. Sometimes you actually feel it. You've been there once before. And therefore, there's nothing too much for you. In fact, most times, many people, many times in life, especially certain times bring it out more than others, you're actually aware that you're almost in touch. You almost you have a very sure sense of it being there. When you learn something that's true spiritually, no? that touches you deeply, you do not have the experience that you're learning something. You have the experience that you're recognizing something that you knew already. You know why? You're recognizing it. It was there already. In fact, that's why you know it's true. How is it that certain things that you hear, you say, that's exactly the way it is. How do you know? If all information is neutral and it's being put into a neutral bag, then, then why do some pieces of information mean more to you than others? Why do some resonate with your inner being? Why? You know why? Because they're in there already. And when something true, and especially something that's true for you, especially something that touches on your own inner being and your path and your uniqueness in life, 
When that goes in and you hear that, you light up. You know why? Because the first light is responding to the second light. It's becoming the second light. There's a resonance that's set up, and that's how you know it's true, and that's how you know it's for you. And all you ever have to do is just sensitize yourself to who you really are. That's all you need. Instead of being confused and looking to the outside all the time, all you have to know is who you are. That's what you so Let it speak. You know, in Torah learning, people who learn Torah, so many applications, person learns Torah. People sit in the best medicine, take, start learning. Suddenly, as you're learning, an original thought occurs to you. It's called a Chirush. A Chirush. You know the Chirush is in Torah? The person's learning Talmudic material, Torah material, and suddenly you have a thought that's unique. Right? It's called a Chirush. You see a new insight. And if you're a serious learner of Torah, you write it down. And some people are blessed with a lot of these. First, you write a book. You write a book of your Chidushim in Torah, your own commentary on the Gemara. Yeah? What a chutzpah. What a chutzpah. You writing your own Torah? What are you talking about? The Ashur is Torah, right? Our job is to learn what the Torah says. What do you mean you're writing your own? Your own original thoughts. Can you imagine the chutzpah? Not a chutzpah at all. It's not your own original thought. All that's happening is your learning has been resonating with the wisdom that was within and it's been brought to the surface, that's all. You're not cooking up an arbitrary thought. The reason you know it's true and fits in with everything else you've learned, and it's an expression of your personality. And that's why most people have the same chiddush. Each one comes to the flavor and the aspect of his own personality. You know, it says that no two prophets prophesy in the same style. Because each one, each one is that the music that comes from a higher world, that is resonating. You know, it says about prophecy, when the king called in one of the Nevi, one of the prophets, and he asked him to prophesy and tell him the future, he was in a tense state of mind. He couldn't prophesy. He was anxious and tense. But he had to do it for the king. So he called for music. Called for music. That in order to set up a certain harmony and resonance within his neshama. And when the music began playing, he was able to... <laughs> but you know what the words are? Listen, listen to these words. V'hayah kenagain hamenagain. Do you know what that means in simple Hebrew? It means, and when the musician began playing, then he prophesied. V'hayah kenagain hamenagain. When the music began to be played by the musician... Then he lifted himself into a higher world. But you know what the words literally mean? When the musician became the music. That's what it is. Vahayor kenagen emenagen. When the musician became like his music. That means, you understand, when he descended into the inner core of what he really was. <coughs> that's the experience of prophecy. <coughs> and, therefore, and therefore, the message is that, that, that everything you experience in life is only the second attempt where you're building it for yourself, but it was there once before, and you've been there before, and you know how to do it, and you've conquered this thing before. Except, first, it was given for free. First, it was just a demonstration. Let's cut life a little bit more fine. I mean, you can do this every day, time this evening. You have to go home and do the homework yourself of putting every experience you've ever had through this thing. <coughs> and if you wonder why you always feel disappointment, why you never feel the thrill that you felt the first time you did something, why you always get let down, the good time never lost. A good time never lost, always lets you down. And the more desperately you want it to last, the more cruelly it lets you down. But right? there's nothing wrong with you, there's nothing wrong with the experience. That's the way the world's built. And if it weren't built that way, there'd be nothing you could ever do. Of course, we want the free thrill of the first experience, that's all. That's what we want. We want the quick fix, we want the quick uplift. We want our hands to be held in the world. That's all we want. But it's, that's, not, that's not what life's about. That's not what's last. The personal maturity knows that that's artificial. They wait for that to be taken away. Then they start putting the work in. Then, then you just, there's a genuine light that shines. Not one that doesn't belong here, one that belongs here. You know what life is if you take it from the moment of birth on? You can divide it up any way you like. You have childhood and adulthood. Yes? The childhood years and the years of being an adult. Can you see the difference? Being a child and a teenager, you can split it up more, but it's for lack of time. Being a child and a teenager, you know what those years are? Years of tremendous inspiration and sense of no limitation. Know that? Children, healthy, normal, psychologically healthy children and teenagers, have a sense of incredible wonder. Incredible wonder. Richness of emotion. Richness of experience. No, a belief that they can be anything and do anything. But when you get a little older, it doesn't last. And people say to me, Rabbi, I think I've died inside. I say, Why? See, when I was 18, I could r cry so richly and laugh so richly. The world was larger than life. Everything was so incredibly rich. And now, everything is flat. They think there's something psychologically... There's nothing psychologically wrong. That's how you're designed to be. Now you're in your real situation. When you were 8 and 18, you were given an, 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 a completely artificial dose of the sense 
The truth is it's not artificial. You really were capable of being anything and doing anything. That's the truth. You were. But then it got taken away so you could get busy doing it. And most people get let down. That's what happens. Most people crash. And they feel that when they were younger, they were rich and alive, and then life was the way it was supposed to be. And now they've been shortchanged. Some people don't. Some people just live right on in the fantasy, especially men. They live right on in the fantasy of being a five-year-old for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yes. And just like when they were 18, they were convinced that they were the world's greatest intellect, chess player, womanizer, musician, movie star, etc. When they 28 and 38 and 48 and 58, and believe me, 68, they still continue believing that they are still the world's greatest, you name it. Just haven't had time to sort of do it yet, but they'll get there. You know, that's, that's how the male mind deals with this problem. Because what's his alternative? What's alternative? You either keep fantasizing that you've done it, or you crash into, a, into abysmal despair and depression. That's what you do. There's no other option. You either crash into despair, okay, or you pretend that you've made it. The real solution, of course, is to do it and make it. But that's hard work. <laughs> but the uniqueness of childhood... The uniqueness is you remember your childhood. You remember that you had no sense of limitation. That you were convinced, you ask a five-year-old what he wants to be. He'll tell you the most bizarre combination of impossibilities. Why? Because he's built with inspiration. The uniqueness of his consciousness, then Hashem gives him an incredible gift of inspiration so that he can begin to discover who he is. Then Hashem takes it away and says, now do it, you like it, now you do it. And you see children going through points in their lives when they suddenly begin a sense of limitation. I was walking to shul with my little son. He was six years old at the time. And uh, suddenly, you know, we're walking along. It's been quiet for two minutes, which is extremely unusual. And then, he had a very worried look. He looks up at me and he says, Abba, I'm not sure if I'm going to marry Debbie or Frida. <laughs> <laughs> my little, little neighbor, see? <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, mm-hmm. Then he said to me with a look of real worry, he said, but Abba, whichever one I marry... The other one's going to be so upset. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. We walk a few minutes more, and as we're walking up the steps to Shul, he stops cold in his tracks, and he looks at me with real concern, and he says to me, but other, whoever I marry, all the others are going to be so upset. <laughs> I said, oh, see? In his little mind, for the first time, he's realizing that's like not all possible. You know, you've got to give up some to have. Not so simple. <laughs> But childhood and teenage years, those are given the, the nature of them. That is a sense of overwhelming inspiration. It's not real, of course, because nothing's been manufactured, nothing's been built, you haven't done it, you haven't learned to walk, you're just, being, you're just being taken on artificially. And there's so many details of childhood that apply. Again, we don't have time to go, you know that if a child or a teenager is shown some aspect of greatness, do you know what immediately happens? It sets up a resonance within their own neshama that they want to be that thing. You know that? All you have to do is take a young child or a teenager to an experience. It can be the most ridiculous kind. It can be a secret agent or a cowboy. It can be anything stupid. Because these days, what, what, what do we show children of greatness? Do we show children any real greatness? Never. The children see in this generation people who really worked on themselves and achieved refinement and self-control. Do we show them that? We don't show them that. We show them people who have developed incredible appetites and lusts. That's what we show them. But whatever it is, whatever you show the child, the child goes home that day and starts practicing. That day starts practicing, whatever the skill was. Tremendous sense of inspiration. I can do it and I can be it. And he goes and he fully believes he's going to be it. Until the next day, he's showing something else and he tries to be that. That's what it is. But when you're older, if you, get, if you don't fantasize, then you know that actually you aren't the world's greatest anything. And that's the coolness of this experience. And it happens in everything. If you look in the Balshiva world, the Balshiva world, right? those younger people who've lived a, a life that's not exactly a Torah life, brought up that way... <laughs> And they become more aware, they become more observant, they get more involved. You know what happens if you speak to them? You'll find that they've been through two phases. You know that? The first phase was an unreal uplift. They met a certain rabbi, a certain teacher, they went to certain lectures or certain education, and they, and they read certain works, and they were tremendously inspired, flying, flying. You know, if you meet those people two years later or three years later, you know what they're going through? Not flying, they're going through hard work. A lot of hard work. Because the first time you hear those sources and you see those things and it resonates with you and you know what it is, it's an incredible inspiration. You fly. But just when you get the feel of what it is, then Hashem takes it away. He says, you like it? Now become it. Do it. Walk through the desert now. Get to Sinai yourself. You know, once a certain young man, he was standing, remember, he went through this process himself, <coughs> and he was standing at a chuppah, the chasen in Yerushalayim, standing next to a certain Rosh Hashiva. And it so happens that this Rosh Hashiva 
had done the same thing himself 30 years before. He was a person who used to go to all night parties and... And now he's a great Rosh Hashim. One of the... He looked down at this young man and he said to him, now, how's it going in Yeshiva? <laughs> so the young, the, young, the young man said to him, you know, Rabbi Sansa, it's very hard. You know, it's very hard. It's amazing. When I started out, every line of Gemara that I learned was an unbelievable insight. I was flying. Now I sit in the base marriage for hour after hour after hour and I feel like I'm sweating blood. It's all labor. It's all incredibly hard work. And he smiled down at him and he said, I see you're in phase two. It was a tremendous revelation. That young man realized at that moment that that's the way it's supposed to be. Not that he lost it. He thought he lost it. He thought he lost it. He thought he was so talented. He used to have Gamora Shirim and he used to snap out the answers and twig onto this. Then Hashem takes it away. And of course the greatest experience here, we don't have time for, let's just deal with a few minutes marriage. Marriage is the greatest example of this, of this experience. <coughs> and if you misunderstand this, then your life is, you guarantee disaster. Guaranteed disaster. And I would say that of all the marriages that are ending divorce now, especially young marriages, which is a characteristic we're having now. Most, many, many marriages, by far the majority, more than 50%. In most communities, the reported level is 60%. In California today, in the Jewish community, they report the divorce rate is 60 to 70%. And that's a community where very few people get married in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so do you understand that those who get married probably have some sense of, you know, at least something, there's some sense of commitment <laughs> compared to all those who don't bother. In the most old-fashioned conservative, I mean, old-fashioned communities where values are still being conserved, the divorce rate is over 50% in the Jewish world. It's climbing in the religious world, you should know that. In the, in the, in the genuinely, deeply religious world, the divorce rate is climbing rapidly. It's still under 1%. <laughs> but it's climbing. It's climbing as the secular values are creeping in. You know why? Because a relationship with a woman, a relationship between a man and a woman, has got two phases. There's an inspiration that is given for free that is meaningless in the beginning. And then it gets taken away. You know when it gets taken away? At the moment you think it's going to last forever. The exact moment that you think it can never die, that's exactly when it gets taken away. And the first phase is called romance. In secular, you know, now, in our culture we call that romance. Romance. And the second phase is called love. Do you know that in Hebrew we don't have a name for romance? you know that? In Hebrew, in Torah, that we've learned before... Uh, We've studied before the idea that every meaningful concept has a name in Torah, because that is the essence of the concept. In Torah, there's a word for love. You know what the, the only word for love is in Hebrew? Ahava. And you know what the root is? Hav. You know what hav means? To give. Love means giving. That's what it is. We think love means taking. The person makes you feel good, you love him. When somebody makes you feel good, you don't love them, you love you. When somebody makes you feel good, right? Well, like when you say you love chicken, you don't love chicken, you wouldn't kill it if you love chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you love you when you say you love someone and you mean they make you feel good you don't love them you mean you using them that's what you mean that's not love love is giving that's why it's based on the word Ava to give this is why parents always love their children more than the children love their parents you know that children parents always love their children more than the children love those parents you know why because the giving goes in that direction and you love where you give and you love where you give yourself and you love where you give yourself unselfishly and totally that's where you love why and how it works is a long story and not for now. But that's where it is. You don't love what you get. You appreciate a little bit, you might do it. Some peripheral aspects of love. But real love is where you give, not where you get. And we have a word for that. Ava, that means love. But romance? What did you give? What did you give? What did you give to this person? You know what romance is? We don't have a word for it. You can't say that in Hebrew. You know that? You cannot say it. If you want to describe the emotion of romance, there's no word in Hebrew. You know why? Because it's a complete illusion. What happens? You're sitting in a room. And suddenly this creature walks in. <laughs> and as you take a look, there's a very strong impression of certain kind of music that sort of wafts in on the wind. <laughs> but from the other angle, there's some vague sort of bells that you hear. Then you get this sort of tight asthmatic feeling, you know, and it's a little hard to breathe. But what is all this? Now, what is all this? <laughs> well, well, that's not a real thing. That's complete illusion. You've been uplifted for complete, it's a complete ridiculous illusion. You didn't share anything. You don't even know this person. You don't know them. You've certainly never given anything. You've shared nothing and given nothing and you've got asthma. <laughs> <laughs> See what's happening? There's an artificial experience that you've been... You know why you get given that artificial experience? Just to get you involved, that's all. 
But it goes. You know when it goes? About two and a half hours after you get married. <laughs> it goes. That's what happens. That's what happens. And it's not a mistake. You know when he's a rabbi? Knuckles are white on the table. He says, I, read, I married the wrong girl. So how long have you been married? It's two and a half months. So what do you mean she's the wrong girl? Why she's the wrong girl? said, Rabbi, when I saw her first, I couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe. I used to look at her and I could not breathe. I had life-threatening asthma when I took a look at her. <laughs> now I've been married for two and a half months. <sighs> breathing fine. <laughs> Explain to the young man, can you marry the wrong girl? That's the way it goes. If you've married for 30 years and you still have asthma, you better see me privately because... <laughs> And if you've been married for 35 years and you hear bells and music, I'll arrange a consultation for you because... Uh, <coughs> but you see, the Western culture in which we live is a culture of the quick fix and the quick thrill and the artificial uplift. And so what do they do in Western culture? They describe a picture that is a picture of romance and they call it love. And young Jews are brought up thinking that that's what love is. And therefore, when they experience that, they don't know that that's called romance that doesn't even have a word in Hebrew. They think it's love. And so what happens is they get engaged in the experience, and just when it's at its peak and can never last, can never end, that's when it ends. Uh, It's a complete misinterpretation of the concept. But that's the West Western education. Where in the West did they tell you, well, this feeling of romance that you have when you look at a woman, you know, it's purely out of, you know what the height of romance is? You know what the absolute apex and epitome of romance is? Love at first sight. Can you hear the paradox? That's what they call it. The time they use the word love, they call it romance. Love, they, they call it love at first sight. But that's a contradiction in terms. You can't love at first sight. Love at first sight means all you can possibly see is the exterior. All you can possibly see about no knowledge of this person. Love at first sight? That's the climax. That's the highest form. But how can anything survive after that? And that's the culture. And how do they teach it to you? She's taking this Caribbean cruise. I know you've never read anything like this, so I'll just tell you what it says. (laughs) She's taking this Caribbean cruise, yes? And as she comes up on deck, there she sees standing at the rail this creature in a starched white uniform with a little cleft in his chin, a few blonde curls blowing in the breeze. It's this music wafting in over the waves. (laughs) The music gets stronger, and, you know, two pages later, the book ends. <laughs> you know why? Because 35 years later, when she comes up on deck, he's lucky if she doesn't heave him overboard. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but those, that's where those books end, and that's where those movies end. They end right after that, because there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no duration of such things. But in Torah, we don't think that way. We know that the first experience is a genuine thing. It's an illusion, but it's genuine. It's genuine. The father picks the child up and he gets him to walk. The child gets tremendous inspiration. In fact, that's where he learns what it is. You know what marriage should be? You know what love should be? Love should be an experience where they are the, with that first thrill. That first thrill is richly felt. Of course it is. It's given for a purpose. But you'd never be fooled thinking that that's what love is. And after that first rich thrill is felt, the person should know that this isn't going to last. As soon as it settles into familiarity, it will go. But if you prepare for it, and you prepare to start transitioning from the experience of artificial thrill to the experience of giving, if you can transition from the experience of taking to the experience of giving, so then you transform romance into love in a smooth transition. Why not? And the third phase is what happens after 35 years of marriage, of giving to each other, two people living together for 35 years, thinking only of how they could make the other one happy. So there's a blissful existence for both people. Then the two of them melt into each other into a tremendous identity. Tremendous identity where the two have become one. First time I arrived in a community in Israel, I was taking a walk through the community (coughs) with a family doctor. And as we walked past a very old couple, elderly couple, means through the war together, many, many things. They were sitting in the sun on a bench together. As we passed them, he said to me quietly, you know, the first time I met those people, they came into my surgery one day. The woman had a wound also on her leg. And, and the two of them sat down across from my desk. And the woman began to expose her leg. And as she, be, she busied herself with exposing the ulcer so that I could see it, the husband leaned across the desk and he said, Doctor, we have a sore leg. We have a sore leg. That's a relationship. He didn't say she or, or it. <laughs> (laughs) 
So what have we, what have we learned this evening? We've learned that light is based on two phases. There's a first light that shines, it's a light that shines, it doesn't belong where it's shining. It's going to be taken away because it doesn't belong there. It's a very high light, it's a tremendously high light. In fact, it's so high that it belongs in a higher place. You know what you can learn from that emotion when you meet someone new? The start of a friendship or a relationship, a genuine relationship, it's a tremendous inspiration. It comes from another world. It's another world. The illusion in it is that it looks like it belongs here and it will never go away. That's a complete illusion, but it's a wonderful thing. It's a marvelous thing. It's a light that, according to the deeper wisdom, lives in a higher place. And it's a gift that it gets given here. It's a completely unreal thing. Tremendous inspiration. It's an uplift into another dimension. That's what it is. But it's not the point. The point of it is only to show you what you can be. And then it gets taken away. Rav Miller always says, imagine you could live for one day. Imagine you could live for one day as the person that you would be if you worked on yourself intensely for 20 years. Imagine you worked on your personality and you refined yourself and you built your intellect and you learned Torah with tremendous intensity and you built yourself with absolute maximum intensity for 20 years. But right now, imagine they let you live like that for one day and then they took it away. How would you feel? You feel tremendously let down to have it taken away. But imagine the inspiration. Imagine the knowledge. Imagine what... Imagine what energy you'd have from having seen what you could be. Then you'd have to work for 20 years to get there. But that's what Pesach is. The first night of Pesach, when Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, the Kabbalistic sources say on the first night of Pesach, you can have whatever you want. You know that? Whatever you want. You can leap to any level you want for free. Given it's a gift, then you have to start working on it. Then you've got 50 days to make sure that it's real. You can leap. No limits. It's fly now, pay later. That's what it is. That's what it is. You can fly, then you pay. First you fly, then you've got to build it, maintain the level. That's the hard work. And therefore, that's the message. We are not feeling, when we let down, when, when the inspiration of a new experience leaves us, we're not feeling that it's a failure. Then we move on to a new inspiration and a new one and a new fix. That's not what we're doing. When the inspiration of a new experience leaves us, that's when we get busy working so that we can make sure that the second experience will be genuine and that the first light will shine and glow and become eventually the second light. Thank you.